Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this morning's workshop entitled Reaching Mental Health Implications of COVID. Our presenter this morning will be Dr. Michelle Law. Uh, if you have any questions during the presentations, please feel free to type them inside of the chat. We will have a Q&A approximately 10 minutes toward the end of the session. Uh, during that time, you can raise your hand if you were unable to type in the chat because I do see some folks are on their cell phone. So welcome, I am Dr. Cooper and I will be hosting this morning's class. Dr. Laws, are you ready? I am ready. Welcome. Thank you, Dr. Thank Cooper. You. Thank you, it's a pleasure and an honor as a good old Baptist. You're muted um, still. Um, we can't um, hear you. Am I still muted? Hmm. Still muted? It says you're unmuted, but we can't hear you. Okay, I'm okay. not sure what to, can you hear me now? Okay, great, I wonder. Yes. But I, I was just saying it's a pleasure to be here and really excited about this presentation today um, at this workshop today. I work for the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services as one of the assistant directors for um, the Division of Mental Health, Developmental Disabilities and Substance Abuse Services. And so it is an honor and a pleasure to be able to share with you all what I'm hoping will be um, helpful information, useful information uh, to help us as the faith community respond to the mental health and substance use which combined, um, we refer to as behavioral health, just as a shortened version um, and, uh, for those two types of conditions, um, combined looking at the ways in which the faith community can play a role in addressing uh, the needs and that we're seeing the urgent and emergent needs. And so what I'd like to do is to share my screen and jump right into our presentation. We will certainly leave time for questions and answers afterwards. But I'd like to go ahead and get us started. And thank you everyone for um, signing up and joining in. As Dr. Cooper mentioned, we are gonna talk about again, the behavioral health implications of specifically the COVID pandemic. The objectives of today's workshop is one, for me to share um, the COVID pandemic's disparate outcomes um, by looking at the data what the data are showing us about the behavioral health implications. Again, that's a combination, just a shortened version of talking about mental health and substance use in particular. Uh, so those implications of the pandemic. Also uh, addressing a little bit why trauma-informed, uh, a trauma-informed approach, specifically a, a culturally and linguistically appropriate trauma-informed approach is critical to the healing process people who will be coming to the church and who have been coming to the church um, seeking guidance from faith leaders on how to deal with the trauma that have, they have experienced during this pandemic. And that can look at, uh, like things, and I'll unpack that a little bit. And the important role that the church and our faith community play and give you some, some uh, practical steps on moving forward in establishing ministries um, and an effective response within your specific churches. And so we will move from concept and from the data to actual action steps. Let me go ahead and get started by level setting. I always have this picture with me when I talk these days about the implications of COVID and particularly on historically marginalized populations that we identify as um, African-American or Black, Hispanic and Latinx or Latino community, American Indian populations or indigenous populations, refugee populations, and even persons living in rural communities. This is a picture of, at the time it was taken, of a 85-year-old um, woman who was sitting waiting for government uh, assistance in the aftermath or any assistance in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina. This picture sort of has traveled around the world in the um, uh, photo um, expose that Time Magazine did. So some of you may or may not have seen it. But I choose this picture today. Fast forward many years after 
um, Katrina 2021. I used this picture and was using it in 2020 because it really conveys the point I wanna make here. And that is that in the United States and in North Carolina, the key factors, in, there are key factors that include or will determine your health outcomes and how well you recover from a or in a natural disaster. Those key factors are who you are, specifically your race or ethnicity, your socioeconomic status, and even your gender to some degree, where you live, your geography, whether you live in a rural area, whether you live um, in an urban area and the zip codes within those geographic locations. How old you are, if you are among our elderly population, if you are children, um, and also your access to what I identify as key capitals, social capital, economic capital, and political capital, right? Your ability to pick up the phone and make a call to the governor, your ability to pick up a phone and make a call to an influential person who has power within your community, your county, your jurisdiction, your ability, and that could be a, a host of people, people who have who are in close proximity to power if they themselves don't, right? So your pastor may be one of those people. You as a pastor if, or a minister, um, if you are on, may be one of those people. Those uh, types of capital, as well as economic and social capital, are tremendous resources that can help determine the outcomes of people, as I mentioned, who are recovering from a pandemic like this COVID pandemic or a natural death. And this woman, this elderly woman, uh, exemplifies all of these factors tied together. We know that the people who fared well during the her, Hurricane Katrina um, and in the aftermath were people who had access to, to money, to economic capital, for people who had access to political capital. So they were the ones that got the call the first time when uh, they were asking people to evacuate. But they also had economic capital, right? They could, not only were they getting the firsthand information, not only were people calling them, not only were they able to call Washington DC even, all the way from the Delta region, right? In New Orleans, Mississippi, uh, to make calls to people at FEMA, people in, in DC, and their calls were getting answered. They understood when the buses were gonna be coming. They knew when, when flights were gonna stop. All of these things we sort of take for granted, but had a tremendous impact on who fared well and who did not, who suffered um, the, the greatest harm and loss and who did not. They had the economic means to take the first flights out. They had the economic means to pack up their belongings and leave and drive out. But remember, there were some people who didn't have access to transportation. They didn't probably have access to a lot of economic resources. They couldn't pull money out of the bank. They couldn't go to hotels um, far away when they relocated. They didn't have family members in other places that they could go to. So I want us to really think about how these factors, their age, their race and ethnicity, oftentimes when we look at and we overlay economic indicators, we see disparities by race and ethnicity. We also see disparities by geography. And these are the same factors that we saw coalescing around uh, this COVID pandemic that made it tremendously difficult for certain populations. Many of those that we serve and that are members of the General Baptist Day Convention who did not have resources to fare well during this COVID pandemic. And so as we began to look at the effects and the impact of COVID, we understood clearly going into this pandemic that the pandemic did not create health disparities, but it illuminated the fault lines across public systems and amplified the inequities by demography. Demography, including those factors, age, race, gender, uh, location, geographic location. So people of color, historically marginalized populations were disproportionately impacted by several, several factors that came together. And those were pre-existing health disparities, long-term historic, persistent and systemic structural health disparities, and also inequities, right? Structural racism played a role. We also knew that in addition to that, that impacted who was overrepresented on the front line, low wage positions 
within the health care and service sectors that made them particularly vulnerable for risk exposure or their exposure to the COVID pandemic. So these were people who were home health workers, health care workers, home health aides. These were people who worked in, um, in uh, fast food restaurants that didn't shut down. They may have shut down their dining areas, but there was still some degree of risk of exposure working in the windows, in the drive throughs right? These were more likely to be our low-wage workers. These were more likely to be people of color. Um, people who had direct contact also increased risk within the hospital setting. We oftentimes think about it in terms of the doctors, the physicians, or the um, nurses or the, um, you know, um, physician's assistants, but there were also people who were cleaning rooms, the, ho the ho uh, housekeepers, the people who were working in the food service sector within healthcare facilities and long-term long care facilities that were at risk. And when we look at the data to see who these people, these workers that had high risk of exposure, Oftentimes they are African-American, Hispanic, Latinx, American Indian. And again, they are low wage workers. Um, these are people with low education um, attainment or people with educational that have been unemployed for years for different reasons. It could have been a mental health uh, condition that kept them out of the labor force in their uh, say profession. And so they were working in these uh, secondary type employments and low wage employments. And then obviously the social determinants that we talk about all the time, access to health insurance. North Carolina is one of 12 states that did not expand um, Medicaid. And so we still have an estimated 1 million people that fall in that gap. They don't make enough money to afford the cheapest plan or the less expensive, least expensive plan uh, on the Affordable Care Act. Um, health insurance uh, coverage plans, and they don't qualify for um, Medicaid at the existing poverty levels um, or thresholds. And so we have people who are most likely these workers that I talked about, healthcare workers, service sector workers, people who are working on jobs in meat processing plants and farms, uh, construction jobs. They don't make enough. And yet, though, they don't qualify or any of the health insurance coverage. So when they got sick, um, they didn't have access to health insurance. And also they worked in jobs that where they didn't have paid sick leave. These are all members of the General Baptist State Convention. They're all members of our churches across this state. And that is important for us to understand this drastic impact. To illustrate this going into the pandemic, we know that a study that was done looking at data from the US Bureau of Labor Statistics that was uh, published by the Economic Policy Institute, we knew going into the pandemic that among workers who stated that they had the ability to work from home, less than one in five black workers and roughly one in six Hispanic workers said that they were able to work from home. And so when you compare that percentage wise of the labor force, just 19.7% of African Americans reported in um, through the Bureau of Labor Statistics data, job flexibilities and work schedules data, using data from the American Time Use Survey, only 19.7% or 20% of African Americans working in the workforce stated that they have the capacity to, or the ability to work from home compared to 30% of whites, 37% of Asians, um, and 16.2% of Hispanics. So when the pandemic hit, when COVID hit back in March 2020, when the governor declared a state of emergency, those workers that were stuck out there, um, increased exposure were more likely Black and Hispanic um, workers. And, and, and we know from the demographics of our membership, those who are attending Baptist churches um, that are within the General Baptist State Convention um, are largely predominantly African-American. And we know even though we see reflections across uh, populations represented across the socioeconomic strata, we know that we have large percentages of persons who would identify as median income all the way down to um, low income, to no income. 
We also knew and know or discovered um, through this pandemic as a result of all the factors that I mentioned before and others that um, African-Americans and Hispanics in particular and American Indians were more likely to die from COVID compared to whites, more likely to get COVID, more likely to be hospitalized. In fact, American Indians and African-Americans and Hispanics across all of these had higher rates compared to his, uh, non-Hispanic whites. So even when we think about the deaths, 2.8% of Blacks compared to 2.6% um, of American Indians, and again, 2.8% of uh, Hispanics were more likely to die from COVID once contracted. And in the hospitalizations, we see similar trends and paths. We know that um, historically marginalized populations, African-Americans or Blacks, and American Indians in particular, were at higher risk of more serious illness if infected with the coronavirus than white adults. So Blacks, 27% more likely, and 27% um, more likely and um, uh, compared to uh, non-elderly adults, 21% and 21% also of white adults who were more likely to get seriously ill if infected. Now, part of this is because again, we came into this pandemic with pre-existing health conditions, high prevalence of hypertension, high prevalence of cardiovascular disease, high, which was a, 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 even a recent study that just came out that I just read in my, in my um, journal feeds, um, high prevalence of cardiovascular disease, still high, high prevalence of renal failure. When you go into dialysis clinics, it's very troubling and sad to see. Many of those on dialysis are black or many of them are poor whites. And so um, we know that you know, geography also plays a role in this. But once we get COVID due to these pre-existing illnesses, um, we were, are more likely to get seriously ill. And as a result of that, we don't talk as much as we should, but the long-term effects, the long haulers, those who are getting sick and sicker and unable to recover health-wise, not economic-wise, which I'll pick up in a minute, um, are also more likely to be uh, HMPs and particularly African-Americans, American Indians, and Hispanics. So when we think about the economic and the social determinants, um, we know, for example, one indicator housing. We know that there is a housing crisis and there was a housing crisis even before the pandemic. But now, and even more so, now that we're seeing um, the effects of um, the removal of the eviction moratorium, we're seeing Blacks and Hispanics and young people, and again, those low wage workers are being hit the hardest by the housing crisis during this COVID pandemic. So this picture again illustrates that it's a picture of a family being evicted, the little girl. Um, and this is a picture um, that was taken and reported or used in um, uh, an article that ran looking at affordable housing in Raleigh um, and the needs. And so this is a little girl playing outside while her family is being evicted from their home in Raleigh, North Carolina. We know another indicator are, uh, you know, economics is, is uh, the wealth gap and, are the wealth gap and the income gap. So back in March, 2021, um, black gaps had widened in terms of uh, the economic impact and looking at unemployment as the indicator. Um, and the Hispanic white gaps persisted, um, was, was stable over time. Uh, over the same times. Black workers in particularly at that particular time were three times more likely to be unemployed than white people in North Carolina. At that, that time, the, um, the unemployment rate in North Carolina for everyone was 7.4% and it was 9.1% for Blacks and 6.8% for um, whites, 9.5% for um, Hispanics and Asian uh, and uh, American Pacific Islanders, uh, uh, we didn't have the data for, but the, 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 the indicators show that across the HMP groups, unemployment, um, the economic recovery uh, have not been even. And this is just another illustration of what that looks like comparing Black 
men and women in terms of the changes of unemployment. And we will still see these trends even when we look across educational attainment, right? And so um, some may say, well, you know, we, we live in an area where, so if you take the triangle, for example, we live in an area where there's quite a few black people that have college degrees. And, you know, they're even in this pan, during this pandemic, even with college degrees that are, uh, um, you know, some people think is the, 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 what they call the neutralizer, um, the equalizer of uh, economic um, uh, disparities. That's not the case. That's not the case. Unfortunately, it's not the case. And so we still see, even among people, your congregation, that you think, that you may think, because of their background information are doing well, may not be doing well in this, uh, during this recovery. So when you see this particular graph, you see Black men um, uh, were the highest um, in terms of uh, changes and uh, lack of changes in employment based on gainfully employed and unemployment. You see, again, unemployment, uh, this looked at by looking at unemployment rates by education and race combined. And again, you find Black men, unemployment rates higher among Black men, um, and also um, followed by Hispanic men and uh, white men. And then again, when you look at those with some college degree, you still see, again, this trend where even with some college degree, you still see these high unemployment rates by race and uh, education. Same for black women. Um, and again, you know, the point here is not to say that education isn't important. Please don't take that away from here. The point is that the, the recovery during this pandemic has not been even, and it has impacted members of our congregations, members of the General Baptist State Convention across socioeconomic strata. And that's the main point I want to make from that. Also, when we think about the pandemic, does anybody remember when George Floyd was murdered? Does anybody remember when Breonna Taylor was murdered? All of these, uh, both of these cases happened at the onset of this pandemic. One in March, right? Um, even though we heard about um, Brianna Taylor later, um, actually happened before we saw all of the protests at the onset and the beginning of the pandemic, going into the pandemic. And so at the same time that we were dealing with the COVID pandemic and its impact on Black communities, the Black community was also dealing with two horrific cases that question our protection and how valued we were or are as humans in America. And I think George Floyd and Breonna Taylor case represents that and indicates that. So you had folk that were worrying about their children being killed by police officers. At the same time, they may have been worried about their loved one dying um, but as a result of this COVID pandemic. And so those, those factors coming together along with the high unemployment and underemployment rates, housing and food insecurities, existing chronic health disease and disparities, people still having to get dialysis in the middle of COVID after being scared to get out, to go out after being told or advised to quarantine and to shelter in place, still needing to get medical attention. All of these things creating um, ongoing and persistent traumas among our congregation. So while churches had to close their doors and not worship inside the church building, in community, things were still happening that, 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 that where people needed, if ever they needed, the church doors to be open. Um, the church as a trauma response center, it was during this pandemic. And we know that because of the guidelines that we were given, uh, many of the churches were not able to be open. And so that created a problem in terms of access to where some people would normally turn to, to be comforted by, 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 by fellow church members, to be comforted and inspired and ministered to by ministerial teams and so forth. 
And even though some of that still went on and happened, not at the same degree or even in the same way. So we think about our seniors, for example, going back to the 85 year old picture representing all of this coming together. When we think about our seniors, our churches used to be the main places where seniors would go for social activity and, in, and, and nurturing and access. Social networks, their main social network was the church. They look forward to come to church on Sundays, not just to hear a good word from the pastor, but to be in the house of the Lord and what that meant to them. We had, when we closed uh, the church doors in the physical church buildings and went virtually, not everybody was able to access or get, get with that, even with phone calls and so forth. Now those were helpful, but there was still, it still left a large percentage or a percentage of the population um, without the anchor that it relied upon to take them through some of the trauma that they were experiencing. We also see it with our kids. And so we experience this community trauma that um, is, is, is leading us now even more so with, among the church community to have a behavioral health response in the form of ministry um, that addresses some of the traumas that people have experienced. One, because in the collective, we know that we, we have a history of trauma that is chronic and complex. Racism, slavery, Jim Crow, so forth, and, and tied to that, um, the structural inequities that, uh, and the impact uh, that, that we've experienced. So trauma affects us and, is, and it affects our health seeking behavior and responses to services delivery. Dr. Averett Moon Parker once said at a Congressional Black Caucus Brain Trust that I had the privilege and the honor of being able to attend back in the late 90s. She was in the Brain Trust and she was on a panel with um, the late Dr. Francis Crest Wellesling. So I thought I was in heaven at the time because these were, they, these were two dynamic and uh, uh, amazing um, speakers and presenters who presented a compelling case. Dr. Averett Moon Parker talked about the fact that the Black community and the collective doesn't suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder because that indicates that the trauma has ended and we're now dealing with the post-effects of the trauma, but that we as a people in the collective, we suffer from what she referred to as DOTS, daily ongoing traumatic stress disorder. My grandma used to say it this way, if it ain't one thing, it's another. And so we know as I march through this, because I want to get to the meat, these slides will be available with the rest of this data in it, um, that it wasn't just Black people that were experiencing um, uh, tr uh, traumatic experiences as it relates to COVID that was leading to mental health and substance use disorders, but we saw an increase across the board, across the general U.S. population. So back in June of 2020, um, the CDC released the findings from a study that looked at, um, that asked, it was a survey that went out and asked adults, U.S. adults, if they had been experiencing several of these, any of these things. So from June 24th through the 30th. And what we found is do that snapshot, that one, that cross-section survey, that one snapshot in time, a data point that over 40% of U.S. adults reported struggling with mental health or substance use disorders. 31% reported anxiety and depression. 26% reported trauma or stressor-related disorder symptoms. 13% um, reported that they started or increased their substance use. And 11% reported that they seriously considered suicide. And I have received calls in my position at the department from pastors um, who are saying, I need help because I am, I, I've been in recovery. The Lord delivered me. I was in recovery, uh, Dr. Laws, but I need to know where I can go to, or my child needs to know where they can go to. So I don't want us to have this idea that these issues are outside of, of our church families because they are very much represented across communities, even within churches. And we know that the church really is a trauma center, right? All of us come in needing some help or another, dealing with something, um, a weakness, a thorn of some sort. And so this, this, these data uh, don't just represent folk outside the church. And that's what I want to impress. We know that African-Americans um, have high prevalences of psychological distress 
especially those that are at the lower end of the poverty um, threshold or the socioeconomic strata. We know that um, adult Blacks and African Americans are more likely to report having feelings of sadness, hopelessness, and worthlessness, according to, sur to um, household survey, than whites. Now, we also know that we're less likely to report, too. So, um, so, so it's, it's a double edge, right? Toward in one instance, we report this, and some people say we have a whole lot to be sad about. We have a whole lot to feel hopeless about, especially when you see acts like a George Floyd played out. Um, and Blacks and, uh, Af and African or African Americans are less likely than white people to die from suicide at all ages. However, during this pandemic, we're beginning to see an increase in suicidal ideation and attempts by Black teenagers. So our children are feeling this. Um, I won't go into this, but there's an association between uh, mental health and also physical health disorder and also our children accessing, uh, being seen in emergency rooms. And again, this is all, of, all across the board. So it's not, you know, I don't want us to leave thinking, oh, we've got as the church family, as ministers, we go out here and say people who are unchurched. No, we have our work to do and cut out for us within the church walls. And that is one of the main um, uh, aims of this workshop is we, we don't even have to go out looking. I can assure you, based on the data and the trends that we are seeing, both quantitative and qualitative, you will have your hands full dealing with con your own congregation or members within the General Baptist State Convention. We don't have to go out, hang our shingles up, asking for business because it's right there ready for us to respond to. And when we tie the socioeconomic indicators or the, the social determinants to our mental health and substance use indicators, we find some interesting correlations. So for example, um, the share of adults who reported symptoms of anxiety and or depression disorder during the COVID pandemic, when you correlate that or when you uh, cross, do a cross tab and look at that by, by some of the demographic um, and, or social determinants, you will find for job loss, 53.4% uh, of uh, persons who, who reported household job loss and that can be that can be your husband your your wife your uh, you know if you have multiple incomes coming in depending upon um you know you got other people living in the household that's contributing to the economics of the household any household job loss 53.4 percent um reported higher rates of anxiety or depression compared to 31.8 or 32 percent who reported that they had not experienced household job loss during the COVID pandemic and when we think about this again by race and ethnicity, and we look at the share of adults reporting symptoms of anxiety and or depression during the COVID pandemic, African Americans, non-Hispanic African Americans, um, and those who identified as other were more likely to report anxiety and depression. And again, when we correlate that to who's losing their jobs, the kids that are falling into the educational achievement gap as a relate as a result of um, years lost in learning or, uh, or lost learning time, um, uh, you know, families that weren't equipped to be homeschools, <laughs> right? Parents who weren't equipped to be homeschool teachers. Um, so for a host of reasons, kids who have lost uh, uh, time, learning time, oftentimes are uh, among our African-American, Hispanic, and, and, and Latinx, and, and, and many of the populations that we knew going in who were challenged. So, so, so there are many reasons people are reporting anxiety and depression or increased anxiety and depression, and particularly among Black community. Like I said, at the same time COVID hit, we had people demonstrating in the streets in mass protests, um, specifically around the killings of Breonna Taylor and George Floyd that happened at the height of this um, pandemic when cases were were, Scott, were, were rising, uh, rapidly rising, well, uh, not just cases, but also deaths. Um, and, it, and, and it's not just our adult population, but we also know that our kids um, are also experiencing uh, 
extraordinarily amounts of distress and stressors, uncertainty, social isolation, school closure, familial changes, and economic instability, losing a family member to COVID, right? And not having access to uh, appropriate behavioral health treatment and services in their communities that they can access or not having church to go to, pastors to call, faith leaders to call, um, who were trained to respond to people in behavioral health crisis. And so we've seen an increase in ED visits, the emergency department visits among all pediatric visits um, uh, between March and October, 2020, compared to the same time in 2019, 24% increase among children ages five to 11 and a 31% increase among adolescents. Now this is compared to, to uh, comparing 2019 to 2020. Okay, and this is just the same data um, uh, presented in a different way, looking at these increases in emergency departments among um, uh, our children, our young people. And I can tell you when you disaggregate it by race and ethnicity, you see, um, I think really some disturbing trends among our black kids that are being stuck in emergency departments. One, because um, some parents are saying, um, you know, I can't, I don't know how to have a child. Uh, and, and we'll talk about that. So uh, again, uh, girls, we're also seeing an increase among girls. Now we're also seeing an increase um, among kids who are calling into the rape and incest hotline. Uh, children who are reporting uh, being sexually assaulted while in, in the homes um, who are being sexually assaulted. And I had a slide that had that data, but if I, um, I can drop that back in for the slides that we make available. But so what we failed to realize is that when, when people were quarantined and asked to isolate uh, social um, distance and to you know, stay within their households, that meant some kids and even some adults were trapped with offenders of not so good stuff. So um, sexual assault, child molestation, we're seeing increases in calls and reports to hot to RAIN, R-A-I-N-N, -N, um, which collects this data among our kids and where, uh, you know, and actually a sexual assault hotline in general calls. And so kids are responding to trauma, the ongoing trauma in different ways. And one of the ways is through increased suicidal ideation. But we are not a people who don't have hope, right? We don't grieve, we don't mourn as a people without hope. That's what keeps us on our knees praying. That's what keeps us turning to our faith leaders. That's what keeps us going to the churches and calling on the churches, whether we show up for those who have been traumatized or not. Our faith is deeply rooted in our collective DNA. It's, a, it's, it's, it's what's held us together. It's what's kept us from, from losing our minds. Uh, Lucille Clifton, the great poet, has put it, I think, in a, a fabulous way when she said, come and celebrate with me that every day something has tried to kill me and has failed. And I think Black folk truly say that on a regular basis. And so let's talk about the church real quickly before we open it up to Q&A. So historically, the Black church has been the gatekeepers and the gateway to the Black community. The Black church has ministered to and met the needs of the spiritual, social, and economic well-being of the Black community. It is considered our house of refuge. It is a place where we organize around social justice and civil rights. It has been a place early on in the founding of Black-owned businesses, hospitals, historically Black colleges, universities, Black church in the earlier years that um, monies were raised to build these wonderful institutions that are still standing today. Um, 
And in the words of um, E. Franklin Frazier, in the complex social makeup of Negro life in America, the Negro church can readily be identified as one of the most important social institutions in America. In Henry Louis Gates Jr.'s um, uh, book and in the uh, documentary or the, the thing that ran on PBS, um, The Black Church, looking at the Black Church, Henry Louis Gates put it this way, no pillar of the African-American community has been more central to its history, its identity and social justice vision than the Black Church. The Black Church has influenced after of the African-American story. And it continues to animate, I love this, it continues to animate Black identity today, both for believers and non-believers, because we know what the data are showing, right? That kids and the millennials um, are more likely to report that they are unchurched today, that they don't have a, a connection, they don't have a church home, that they, they practice faith outside of a church. Um, in that sense, the Black church functions on several levels as a spiritual center, a place of worship, and as a social center and a cultural repository as well. Um, a living treasure trove of African-American sacred, cultural history and practice. Literally, Gates says, it is the place where, quote, the faith of the fathers and mothers, end quote, is summoned and preserved modified and reinvented each Sunday in the process of cultural retrieval and transformation all at the same time. In the letter from a Birmingham jail that Dr. King wrote, Dr. King wrote in, on April 16, 1963, and I quote, that there was a time when the church was, a very, power, was very powerful. It was during that period that the early Christians rejoiced when they were deemed worthy to suffer for what they believed. In those days, the church was not merely a thermometer that recorded the ideas and principles of popular opinion. It was the thermostat that transformed the mores of society. And so we know without question that the black church is, plays a key role and I know without question that the three professions that are still most highly respected in our community are our faith leaders, our pastors, educators, and doctors. And in many instances, the church is in the physical sense, the black church can play a critical role in pulling all of these together during um, this critical time where we are beginning and trying to recover from this very challenging, these very challenging last two years at the grips of, uh, under the grips of the COVID pandemic. And I say that to say even more so for the behavioral health needs or meeting the behavioral health needs. So when it comes to mental health and substance use disorders, however, it's important for us to be honest and transparent about where we've been where we might be and where we need to go. And so as I conclude and bring us to some tangibles, I wanna lift up these points. Historically, mental health and substance abuse and tab talk in, in the church. They've been stigmatized issues. And we have had not, I mean, there are examples where pastors are doing it, it's doing it right. I think my church, I think, uh, you know, other churches, right? So I'm a member of Union Baptist and we have um, ministerial, we have, uh, you know, a, a behavioral health ministry, right, led by a trained um, behavioral health expert and practitioner, Dr. Tanya Armstrong. We, we have uh, Stevens Ministries. We have, so some churches are doing it well, and I know it's not just Union Baptist. But in, in, in other instances, there have been inadequate and in some instances, inappropriate response. So for example, people are still telling folk who come and they say, I hear voices in my head that, oh, those are demons, just pray about it. With no inclination that that might be uh, evidence or my child keeps talking about voices. Those are not demons in some, you know, 
in many instances. It could very well be uh, a sign that a child needs to be or a person needs to be screened for schizoaffective disorder or schizophrenia or bipolar disorder. And so the, 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 the common response, just pray about it, or it's a demon if you're dealing with uh, uh, substance use or just get the monkey off the bat, off your bat, let's pray about it to get the monkey off the bat. Well, like someone said to me, just because you get the monkey off, off your back, if you're in substance use recovery, Dr. Laws, it doesn't mean that the circus has left town. And so we got to understand now, and particularly at this time, the General Baptist State Convention, had, we, we absolutely have to, all of the churches that make our convention, we've got to shift our and our approach to dealing with what is there and what we are faced with and what we will confront. The behavioral health and the mental health needs of people who will be coming back or who are still, who never left and who have been shown up at every virtual service and so forth, um, but who may be battling uh, with a substance use or a mental health condition. And so two points worth highlighting before I give you a, some practical steps on how we do that. Blacks are less likely to seek treatment for mental health and substance use services. We've got to normalize that. We've got to do away with the stigma. We've got to not make folk ashamed. And how do we do that? People are delivered by our testimony. People are delivered by our testimony. When I talk to women, um, when I minister, when I preach, um, every if I'm led to, I will disclose I've dealt with depression. I've, you know, when my grandmother in particularly passed away and we had been praying for a deliverance and miracle, um, I was ready. And then when my aunt, who was like my sister, died unexpectedly, I was struggling. And it wasn't, I couldn't, I, I, I pray and believe in prayer. I have uh, prayer warriors surrounding me, but I couldn't shake it. Right. And so I understood that I needed professional help. And so seeking a therapist or a mental health counselor, we got to remove the shame from that. And pastors and faith leaders have got to get away from just simply saying, come on, let's pray about it. One, because we're less likely to seek treatment in the first place. And if you're saying it's my faith, of course, we're going to try to to demonstrate that we have faith, but try it as hard as we might. There are some mental health conditions and substance use disorders that require professional treatment. And Blacks are less likely to stay in treatment compared to whites. And there are lots of reasons, again, the stigma and the shame, lack of culturally tailored treatment and lack of cultural representation among providers. And so as we build our church ministries, we've got to do it from a culturally, linguistically appropriate, trauma-informed approach. And that's important. So we have to have humility and responsiveness. We've got to empower people. We have to collaborate with experts. We have to stand up and identify people in the congregation who aren't afraid to tell their testimony. Now, I know this has to be tempered with feeling safe and like it's okay to do so. Because like I say, sometimes when, you know, opening up altar calls, sometimes church folk can make you ashamed to come to the altar and say, you need to be delivered from something or you want to be saved, right? All we, all it takes is for one person who's dealing with a mental health condition to get that side eye look from somebody in the congregation. So it's up to faith leaders to normalize this, to say that it's okay. And I will stand here first as a faith leader and say that I too have been where some of you might be right now. And it's okay, right? So it's going to be up to us to break these bad patterns. We've got to make behavioral health education a priority, especially among our leadership. Get training. Go, don't just stop with your divinity or theology degrees. Go and get training. Go and look at taking classes on behavioral health, on clinical uh, 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 spiritual counseling on, you know, go and, 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 and become educated, read some books, read some literature about behavioral health conditions and disorders. So you will know it when they come into your 
your your your student uh, your um, study for counseling. So so you if you don't have professionals in your church that you can send them to right away, so you will know um, what it looks like that it ain't just a demon that they're dealing with that they may truly be dealing with a behavioral health or a substance use disorder that needs someone beyond your expertise. Establish behavioral health ministries and peer support networks. The more we make it okay for people to stand up and say, I need help, even in private, even in small group settings, the more likely we will be able to identify peer supports that we can um, send someone to. But if you send someone to that person who doesn't believe, who believes, who's, who's, a, who's an awesome prayer warrior, and they are the ones assigned to do to pray, um, and but they don't believe that mental health or substance use disorder requires a professional response. Um, and they and they just tell people just pray harder, just pray harder. I'm 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 rebuking, I'm declaring and decreeing and da da da. You know, sometimes that can make things worse. But wouldn't it be wonderful if in our churches we identified who among the prayer partners are, can be peer support specialists also for a mental health or a substance use disorder. How much more impactful and powerful that would be. And then learn where resources are and share those resources. So in every area across North Carolina, there are uh, LMEs or MCOs. They will later become tailored plans who deal with, uh, who um, provide mental health and substance use services and IDD to persons who um, are Medicaid or um, uninsured populations, there are private providers. Some people, like I said, this affects folk across the socioeconomic strata, right? Think about, I don't care who you are and how much money you make. If you've had to uh, deal with having your mom in an ICU unit and you couldn't go hold her hand and she died in that ICU unit, that does something to you. Your money could not buy you access and entrance, your status, your job title, your position. So even private providers know who they are and where they are. Local health departments, VHUCs, behavioral health urgent centers, they exist, crisis centers, helplines and associations. And this resource, um, there's a resource that's available on DHHS's website that has pulled all of these into one document. Get it, have it available. In fact, Sunday, uh, share with people that you put this resource on your web pages, on your bulletins, the link to it in your bulletins, so that people know. And it's services, access resources for uh, access to resources and information for persons with behavioral health issues, intellectual developmental disabilities, and traumatic brain um, injuries across the age um, uh, cohorts as well. So from children all the way to seniors. And so where do you start in my last 10 minutes before we open it up for 15 minutes of uh, Q&A? First start, convening a planning team. Assessing who in your, who can help plan this. Not necessarily implement it because that's another step. The planning team may not be the implementation team, but who is who has that strategic planning mind? Who has who can see that big picture, and who can also see the pieces that you need to implement something? The steps. Who's a good visionary in the church? Who has that experience working with behavioral health folks? And ideally, it's people with lived experience, because until you've had to try and ask, get somebody involuntarily committed, or because they are in a mental health crisis or until you've had to calm down a child who's, who's stolen everything and you've had to lock up everything in your house and you're trying to keep them from leaving the house at three o'clock in the morning in search of drugs, until you've had to go and, 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 and get that loved one out of a crack house or a drug house, until you've waited for your daughter to come back home and, and, and you know that they're probably out there doing sex work. You really don't to support a drug habit or to in response to a mental health trauma. These are real issues and cases that people in the church come every Sunday carrying into the church. And unless we are equipped, they leave the same way they've come. 
So do, and then step two, assess your church readiness. Do you have a supportive faith leader or pastor? Do you already have a health ministry? Do you have behavioral health professionals among your members? Do you have broadband capabilities so you can do um, virtual groups until you open back up your doors to, so that you can you know, share information, have webinars at your church like this, right? So assess your church readiness. Do you pretty much um, have an older population because their mental health needs may look different. They may not be out here providing sex work, right? As a senior, as a mother of the church to support a mental health or substance abuse habit. But they, they, that doesn't mean they don't have one, right? And so how, you know, assessing the readiness, right? Surveying your members, step three, creating a survey. Uh, is this something that is needed or wanted? Is there support among the church members? What are the unique needs? So doing a mental health assessment or behavioral health assessment, and you can make it anonymous. All you need is the data. You don't need to know who. You just need to know if, what, and, 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 and where, right? What are the common issues? Um, tools you can use or surveys, health assessments, and you don't have to help you and direct you if you're interested in creating one um, and get those done. And then step four, assess community resources. What exists in your community? Whether they're community-based resources, government resources, and that can be state, federal, or local. What already exists? Do you have a relationship as a faith leader? Have, do you even know what resources are available in your community when somebody's in a behavioral health crisis? Starting there is a good place to start. So knowing where to go, and that's why it stood on its own before getting to the steps, knowing where to send people, even if you are not equipped, private resources, what's out there. And then, so you've got your planning team, but then create an implementation team. Now, people who can be a visionary may not be the same people who can carry it out. So understanding the difference. Um, so uh, deciding is it going to exist within an existing auxiliary are you going to make it a sub team within your health ministry or will it stand alone and then recruit committed and i underscore committed members members who will be in this for the long haul and often it is the case that it's people with lived experience because they've been there and they know what it takes and, and, and they've been waiting for an opportunity. Some people may have lost their kids to overdose. It's most likely that in our churches, when we open back up the doors, if you haven't already, or in our churches now, whether people are attending virtually or not, um, or in person, somebody has lost somebody to COVID and is, and is dealing with that unresolved grief, unattended to grief, Somebody's lost somebody to suicide or substance use, opioid addiction, ODing, and the like. You will find your most committed members among that group of folk. Um, or people may have a calling for it, a passion for it, right? They, this is their calling, and they've always wanted to help in this way. Establish goals, a mission and a vision, and use data, the data that you've collected, to inform and guide how you set up and what you do how you plan, organize, and implement your activities. What are people asking for? Not what you want them to have, but where is the greatest need? Is it children? Is it seniors? Is it substance use? What is, and that comes by data. Let the data drive, use the surveys, and then tailor your activities around that. Promotion and communication plan, you know, use your church bulletins. Every fourth Sunday will be Behavioral Health Sunday every third, whatever, right? And in your bulletins, do something, share something about mental health and substance use, an issue, plan an event or an activity, and then do some mailings. People don't do snail mail much anymore, but guess what? We found at the state level that that is still an effective way to reach people, especially in rural communities. So if your church is in rural community, don't, don't and you barely have broadband um, with you know capabilities, you have spotty 
internet services and so forth. Don't rely on that. Yes. Only use, go back to the old time way. Because guess what? Seniors like to get stuff in the mail and they'll read it. And even if they don't have good literacy levels, people love to get mails. I saw a documentary on um, how Trump was so effective reaching rural America. They sent out millions of mailings, millions of mailings, not in addition, well, in addition to the video and audio stuff. And one thing they shown was they were affected at reaching populations that were tucked away and rev revving them up, even, in, even if it's in the most malicious and harmful way that they've done it, but they used mailings. They dropped letters in the mail. You can do that. Pastor sending a note saying, I know this has been a hard time for everybody. Here are a few resources if you're dealing with a mental health issue. And then evaluate, reassess, and refine. Is what you're doing working? Is it meeting the need? What do you need to change? And these are just some resources, some hotlines that are available. Hope for NC helpline is free. 1-855-587-3463. We stood that up to provide 24-hour help for people. Um, peer support specialists, you can be connected to the hotline there. There's problem gambling hotline. You've got people who sit on their phone all, all the time. And that behavior is similar to gambling. So you got people who are addicted to social media. Um, and so, you know, there are resources. NC for Vets, if you're a veteran, the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. Uh, and again, just incorporate really the messages uh, to eradicate stigma, I cannot underscore. So that concludes the presentation. Um, I have 32 seconds left. I am surprised. You can reach me either way. You can reach me um, at my uh, work address, email address, michelle.laws at dhhs.nc.gov. That's Michelle with two L's, dot laws, L-A-W-S, at dhhs.nc.gov. If it's for, uh, you know, other types of invitations, speaking, preaching, um, you know, one-on-one -on -one consultation and that kind of work, um, uh, please send it to my, my personal email at malaws007 at gmail.com. M-A-L-A-W-S-007 at gmail.com. All right, thank you. Now we, I will toss it back to you, Madam Moderator. Dr. Cooper, and we can start with the Q&A. Thank you so much. That was a wonderful, wonderful, <laughs> informative uh, presentation. Um, I learned so much. I'm looking forward to going back and doing some more research on my own for my congregation as well as for the convention. And so thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your information and your gifts. As of right now, I do not have any questions in the chat. Okay, I just got a hand raised. Sister Davenport, can you unmute yourself and ask your question? Okay, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Uh, good morning to everyone. I just also want to say to Dr. Laws, uh, that was an excellent uh, presentation. Uh, I'm Secret from the Mount Gilead Baptist Church here in Durham, where Senator Lucas was a member. And I wanted to know if we could possibly uh, get a handout? Yeah, absolutely. So I will make sure I will send it to Dr. Barr or I, I will send it forward um, and, and they will share the presentation slides. Yep. Okay. Thank you so much. And I knew as soon as you popped up who you were. <laughs> <laughs> and that's exactly who I thought of when I first, when you popped up, I was like, Senator Lucas was, yeah, so. Okay, uh, Sister uh, Bernadette Potts, you can ask your question now, please. Good morning. You yourself. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, Bernadette Potts with Oak Ridge First Baptist Church under the leadership of Dr. James A. Webster. And it was a, a very um, telling presentation and I appreciate it. You mentioned that there is a list of resources on the Department of Human Health Mm -hmm. website. Um, yes, I'll, go ahead. Uh, I'll go ahead and drop that 
in um, now, but it'll be in the slide deck. I'm going to go ahead and drop the link to it in, um, in the chat. So those of you who are on via chat can uh, access it. Okay, thank you. And I have one more question. I know that there is a mental health first aid course. Mm -hmm. um, is that something that is available to churches, maybe as a group? So uh, my team, uh, DHHS, uh, does the, uh, a lot of the mental health first aid trainings. And so you can, um, you can actually send a request to get that to the michelle.laws at dhhs.nc.gov and we will see what we'll be able to do. Uh, there's some things going on at the national, at the, at the MHA, at Mental Health America, Health Association of America's uh, um, level, which is, which are the owners technically of that curriculum, of that training. But Send me an email to the michelle.laws at dhhs.nc.gov requesting that and any other churches who want mental health first aid training and, and I will uh, help you all get access to that. Now, there is a fee for some if you do it on your own because you can also have people directly go and get mental health first aid training. But our team also offers the training that was already paid for through taxpayer dollars. So. Um, just send me that that um, request. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question in chat. Excellent, excellent. What book would you recommend uh, to read? Yeah, so um, I would first start out with, um, so there's several and I have a, I will send a, um, a list. We do have a, a, um, a book list that we recommend. But Black Pain is one. Um, and the other one I'm trying to remember, and hold on, because it's on my, um, remember the right title of it. It's not Get Your Mind, it's, um, I'll tell you what, it'll probably be better. Let me send the actual book list because there's several. There's several. It, it's, it's, um, Healing from, let me see, it's black, it's, it's trauma. Oh, I can't remember the title. I will send it to you. I'm going to mess it up. The, uh, the sister is out of the, she's out of uh, Atlanta. Um, and it's very thick, but it is a good resource for faith leaders. It's like a textbook almost, but it's, let me see if I can pull up the, the list. I will send the list and that, that is one I definitely recommend that you get. Let's see if I can find it. It is there it's social injustice and mental health now it's very dense so but it's social and then the in um is is in um parentheses justice and mental health but it unpacks the link of social it, it ties social the concept of social justice to mental health and then it also provides this this um this paradigm on teaching mental health. And then the other one is, um, uh, so I said Black Pain, Terry Williams, social injustice. Um, and then the other one is understanding the impact of trauma. Let me see, it's, it's the impact of tra trauma, abuse, some, tra understand the impact of trauma on, But it takes you into the trauma piece of it. It may be trauma and shock, un, un, understanding mental health in, I think it's trauma and shock, understanding mental health. I will send that one to you. So those are the ones I would start out with. Um, there is one for children that 
uh, APA did, and I'll just send you, I'll, I'll send the list along with the, the um, PowerPoint. But those are the ones I would start out with in terms of books. Social Injustice in Mental Health, Black Pain, and um, the trauma one. <laughs> but I'll send the list to you. Okay, great. Just have one comment for you in the chat. It says, thank you for sharing this information, Dr. Laws. This is an issue which needs our attention as we care for our people. So thank you. And I just want to be clear, I'm going to send the handouts to, to you and to Dr. Barr, and then you'll get them out. I just want people to know that I see Yes, that yes that's fine. <laughs> and, so that, and I got a a direct private one. I don't, y'all don't, as they say, blame it on my hand and, and my busy hands and that my heart. If and, and, and sometimes I might forget. So I will send it to the moderators and that way they will make sure everybody gets it. So I won't miss anybody. Sorry. That's fine. No, uh, if, Dr., if I get her out for Dr. Barr and he'll make sure that it's available uh, okay. in the email link or on the website so they'll have access to it. Just okay. need to give us a little, a little turnaround time to put it back up on the site, but it will be available for everyone uh, who would like the resources. Right. Okay, well, there are no more questions uh, and I don't see any additional hands raised. I just wanna again say thank you, thank you, thank you. This was wonderful. It was very informative. It was necessary for a time such as this as we are still in a pandemic, but journeying to the other side. So what does it mean for us to provide healing for our congregation, our family members and our community who are struggling and to begin to remove the stigma of mental health and what does that mean? Um, and to have a real authentic conversation about it um, and bring it to the table, wrestle with it, deal with it, and make sure that those that are wrestling with it are able to receive the care that they deserve. So thank you so much for all your resources. Um, be blessed. Would you like to offer final words? No, I'll just say everybody, <laughs> stay in prayer, stay faithful, stay hopeful, stay protected, wear your face, uh, your mask when out in public and get vaccinated. Awesome. Thank right. you so much. Everyone have a blessed day. Looking Thank forward you. to seeing you uh, this afternoon on our panel discussion and this evening for our time of worship. Thank you so much and see you this afternoon. God bless. Thank you. God bless you. Bye-bye. Thank you.